have said last time that we were going to do two sessions on 2, 11, and 12. Well, I think we need three. So in this session, we're going to focus on the connection between the level of taking care of passions, desires in our lives, and the level of conduct. Father, it's clear that as Peter moves from the level of feeling to the level of action, huge things are at stake because he wants this to be visible to the world so that they actually move from a position of calling Christians evildoers to glorifying you because of our behavior. So that's a miracle at stake here, and I pray that you would help us walk right into it and experience it. In Jesus' name, amen. Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions that uh, of the flesh which wage war against your soul. Now, w w we focused on that last time and argued that uh, first comes a sense of who we are, our being, which was addressed in 2, uh, 9, and 10. And now we come here to the level of feeling or passions and here we come to the level of conduct and that's really crucial that we see that order who we are in Christ shaping how we have if affections and feelings and emotions and loves and passions in Christ leading to a kind of conduct which then the world will see that they may see your good conduct your good deeds and give glory. So that's, that's the order, and, and we've arrived at, at the level between the passions and conduct. But we didn't last time look at this key verse back in 114, just to remind ourselves. As obedient children, do not be conformed, that would be in your conduct, to the passions of your former ignorance. So there's ignorance leading to sinful passions, because passions aren't based in truth. They're all flowing out of error, which leads to conformity to those old passions. Or if we change this ignorance with new truth now, which this whole letter is designed to give us, then new passions will come into being and we will not be conformed to these old passions. So back here, that's what was supposed to happen here. Abstain from these passions. Don't be conformed to these passions. And the best way not to be conformed to these passions of the flesh is to kill them, get rid of them, and replace them with new passions of love for God and love for people and hoping fully in the grace that is being brought to us and earnestly desiring the sincere, sincere spiritual milk of the word because we've tasted that the Lord is good and he is now our new passion. So we're moving now to the level of conduct, which leads to the level of seeing by the world, which hopefully leads them to glorify God. That's the glorious sequence of these verses. Keep your conduct now in conformity with new passions. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable. For those of you who like Greek, Kalein, beautiful, beautiful. Keep your conduct beautiful. You, you have a beautiful Savior and bring your life into conformity to his beauty so that people can see that beauty. So that, here comes, here comes the great purpose. What's the purpose of the conduct that is beautiful in conformity with new passions for Christ that reflect his beauty? So that when they speak against you as evildoers. So it starts with we're, we're getting a bad rap here. That is, the world is looking at Christians and they're saying, no, they're evildoers. So we're starting... Way behind, 
<laughs> we, we, we don't have a leg up on the world here. We, we are behind and have to catch up. So how, how does that happen? How do we conduct ourselves so that this slander goes away? Because he wants it to go away. He says, when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see something namely your good deeds, and change their mind that you're not evildoers, you're good doers, and find the reason for that in God, and thus join us in declaring the excellencies of him who called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. So how, how are we to do that? Well, it says, by our good deeds, or just, what, three verses later? Let's see. It says in 2.15, For this is the will of God, that by doing good, by doing good, you should silence the ignorance of foolish people. Well, what is that ignorance saying? That ignorance is saying, you are evildoers, you Christians. And he wants that to be silenced, and he said silence it with good deeds. Now, a big danger that has to be avoided here is saying, well... I guess we have to do whatever we need to do to keep the world from calling us evildoers, to keep the world from maligning us. That is emphatically not true. And we know it from 1 Peter because here in chapter 4, look, look at how he's talking about the maligning that comes to Christians. The time is past for doing what the Gentiles want to do. All right? We are not any longer going to do what the world wants us to do, living in sensuality, passions, drunkenness, orgies, drinking parties, and lawless idolatry. So we're just going to quit that. He says, you're, the time suffices that is in the past. You were joining them in all these things, and now you're not going to do it anymore, no matter what they say. With respect to this, they are surprised that you don't join them in the flood of debauchery, all those things, the debauchery, and they malign you. So here's a text that says, no, when you see somebody maligning you because you don't walk with them in lawless idolatry, you don't walk with them in the old passions, you don't walk with them in drunkenness or go to the orgies or do the drinking parties or in involve yourselves in sensuality, you don't do those things anymore, and they're making fun of you and speaking evil of you and calling you a nut, you don't say, oh, well, I guess I don't want them to malign me, so I'll just go back to doing those things. That's a mistake a lot of people think you have to do in order to win people to Christ, and that's not the strategy of Peter. When Peter says good deeds here, he doesn't mean you join them in their sin. He means proactively be involved in doing the kinds of things that even the world knows are good deeds. There are many things Christians are going to do and not do which the world are going to think are evil deeds. But we overcome that, at least for some of them, by abundant good deeds. Now, what would be an example of that? I just tried to think of an example. And I'm 69 years old as I'm recording this. I have been in the pro-life movement for the last 35 years. 35 years ago, when we marched and did rescues, um, there would be loud, critical, pro-choice people across the street hollering things like this to me and others. You're just a bunch of white, middle-class men who don't care about women after pregnancies or in pregnancy. You don't care about women at all. You don't care about babies after they're born. All you care about is your right-wing agenda, and on and on and on. Now, we were being accused then of being evildoers, indifferent to women, indifferent to babies, um, having racial privilege, and so on. So evildoers, you pro-life people are evil. You know, today, hardly anybody talks that way. Th th there are other issues that they may say we're evil in doing. But that criticism of not caring about women, not caring about them after the pregnancy, before the pregnancy, not caring about babies after birth, hardly anybody does that. You know why? Because in the last 30 years, 
Thousands, literally thousands, of crisis pregnancy centers have sprung up across the nation, almost all of them run by Christians, which means that good deeds have have silenced the ignorance of foolish people. That's what has happened, and therefore the aim here is not that we start being pro-choice in order to avoid criticism. The aim is that we do so much good in the world that the world cannot but see it, which leads them then hopefully to glorify God on the day of visitation, and that's what we want to talk about next time.